Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Hacker Tools Lecture Number Three. Today, we will be covering uh, text editors and version control. I think two really important and exciting topics. Um, as for text editors, I think as programmers, we end up spending most of our time interacting with plain text files. Look at all the different tools you'll learn to use in this class and uh, use outside of this class on programming related things. You're going to spend most of your time in your text editor not your shell, not debugger, not other tools. And so for that reason, I think it's really worth investing time into figuring out like, what text editor works best for you. Because uh, people have lots of different opinions on this. Uh, and so it's, it's worth finding an editor that fits your needs. Um, really putting the time into learning the tool really well and uh, putting the time to customize the tool to make it do exactly what you want it to do. Um, and I think the way you learn a new editor is you just force yourself to use that editor for whatever you do for a couple weeks. So like you're taking a class or whatever, you need to write programs. Well, if you want to learn Vim, force yourself to use Vim for a month. And maybe initially you'll be slightly less productive than you were with whatever tool you were using previously. But really, it's the only way to become really good at using some new editor. Um, and if you switch to a new editor that has a kind of difficult learning curve, Maybe it'll be slightly less productive for a couple of weeks, but it'll begin to pay off starting maybe two or three weeks in. Um, so in this class, we're going to teach you kind of the basics of Vim, which is one powerful, commonly used text editor. Um, but we encourage you to experiment with other options. Um, we're teaching Vim because John and Jose and I all use Vim, and so that's the only tool we really know super well. But uh, different people have different opinions. Um, we even have some links in the course notes um, uh, linking to the editor wars. Like people have really strong opinions on Vim versus Emacs and have uh, had many flame wars on Usenet and stuff based on uh, well, comparing these two editors. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, um, in this lecture, so in this 15 minute unit, we're going to uh, kind of introduce you to the basics of Vim. We can't really teach you how to use this powerful editor in just 15 minutes. And so the focus is more on teaching you the basics and then showing you what some of the more advanced functionality looks like. Um, teaching you some of the philosophy behind the tool, and then giving you links to resources uh, so you can master the tool in your own time. It's really to inspire you to put in the effort to learn this tool well. Um, and a lot of the lessons we're going to teach you are going to be in the context of Vim, but the idea should translate to any other tool you want to use, even if the exact sequences of commands are, are not the same. Uh, so let's get started. Um, we have a couple, if you look at the course notes, there are a couple links in there that you might find interesting. Looking at surveys uh, for which editors are popular among different programmers, like Stack Overflow ran this uh, survey just last year, and uh, the results are kind of interesting. You can get some inspiration from there if you want to figure out which tools you might want to experiment with. Um, and so there are two main classes of text editors. There are uh, ones with graphical interfaces, um, things like Atom or Sublime Text. And then there are tools that well, we're going to spend our time talking about here, which are command line text editors. So well, this is the command line. You learned how to use the shell uh, last week when John taught you how to use the shell. Um, even if you eventually decide on using a graph, uh, an editor with a graphical interface, it's worth uh, learning some command line editor, or at least knowing the basics. Um, because it's really useful when editing files on remote machines. So like say for a class you need to log into Athena and run some code there. Well it's really convenient if you can just SSH in and then run a text editor in your terminal on that remote machine rather than having to deal with copying files back and forth or using some of the more complicated techniques we'll cover slightly later in today's lecture. Um, so before we get into Vim, I'm actually going to show you a different text editor. There's this text editor called Nano. Um, and so the way you invoke it is just like any other shell command, type nano, and then it takes an argument, the name of the file you want to edit. So in this lecture, we're actually going to be editing the course notes for this lecture, kind of meta. Um, this is a good text editor to be aware of, because if you eventually end up setting on, uh, settling on using something with a graphical interface, like say, Atom, well, if you SSH into a machine, um, like log in remotely to a different machine and want to be able to edit text there, you're going to need to be able to use something like this. And this is one that's really simple to use. So this is what the interface looks like. Um, there are basically instructions always visible at the bottom of the screen. And you can move around using the arrow keys. So there you see the cursor moving around. And I can just go and edit text directly. 
type in whatever I want, and it works more or less as you'd expect it to. And basically the only key combinations you're gonna really need to use among these options down here are uh, this one here, that carrot, oh, does anybody remember what that notation means? Talked about it a little bit during the shell lecture. Uh, that means, uh, that, so that caret is referring to the control key. So if I type control O, that invokes that write out command. And this editor asks me, okay, what file name do I want to write it to? And it's pre-populated with the name that I open the file with. So if I want to rename the file, I can do that here and save it with a different name. But anyways, I can do control O and press enter and it saves the file. So pretty straightforward. And if I want to close the editor, I can just press control X. That's also given down here in the bottom left. And there we go, I've modified that file. If I open it up again, I can see that I, I deleted that word and that change has persisted. So very simple text editor will be pre-installed on all the systems you use, and so it's just convenient to know that this is a thing and you can use it if you need to. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is a text editor that's great to use when you don't know how to use anything else and you're logging to a remote machine that has no other, no other editors installed and you need to make a small change to a file. This is not the thing you want to use to write complicated programs because it doesn't really have super great support for doing anything fancy that you would want to do um, using your text editor. So instead, what should you do? Well, we're going to teach you how to use Vim, which is one powerful text editor. Um, Vim is spelled V-I-M and you can launch it just like you launch the other editor. So Vim and then you can give it the name of a file and you'll see this interface. Um, okay, so to tell you a little bit about the philosophy behind Vim, this is actually like a pretty complicated tool with a lot of neat ideas behind it. So before I actually go and like teach you how to use different key commands to make you do things, I'll tell you a little bit about the philosophy behind the tool. Um, so one idea that the programmers uh, behind this tool, or behind the earlier versions of this tool have, was that when you're programming, like we're not using this to write essays or something, we're using this to edit code, edit, edit plain text files. And so when you're doing that, you actually don't spend most of your time writing characters, you spend most of your time moving around the file, reading the text and manipulating the text in different ways. You don't just kind of like put your cursor somewhere and then just go write a bunch of text, right? You go and like find a function somewhere and like edit some text there and then go jump somewhere else in the file, edit some text there. And so, if we want a tool that's designed for doing that sort of thing, um, maybe it shouldn't behave like other text editors like say Microsoft Word. Um, and so there's this idea in Vim uh, called uh, modes, like Vim is a modal editor. The entire tool can be in one of different modes designed for doing these different kinds of things. And so there's a mode for inserting text, like when you want to go and type in a bunch of characters. But there's also a different mode for moving around the file or manipulating the file in different ways. Um, that's called normal mode. And since in programming you actually spend most of your time reading or manipulating code rather than just inserting code, um, you spend most of your time in Vim in what's called normal mode. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to switch between modes and how to know which mode you're in in a moment. Another powerful idea behind this tool is that Vim is programmable. And so this, uh, this tool is uh, comes with this programming language called VimScript, and you can customize a lot of aspects of this tool by writing uh, configuration or even more complex programs or plugins in VimScript. And it's also programmable using bindings for different languages if you want to write code in Python or Ruby or whatever. There are probably bindings for whatever language you want to use. And so this editor is really heavily customizable through, uh, through that. Another thing is that even the interface of the tool is kind of like a programming language. Like the way you move your cursor around and make changes to the file is through a sequence of commands. These are usually single keystrokes. These commands have uh, mnemonic names. So like, we'll, we'll talk about the details in a moment, but when I'm in normal mode and I want to go to insert mode, I can press I. Or if my cursor's somewhere and I want to substitute the character uh, under my cursor, I press S. Or if I, want to, if I want to put my cursor somewhere and replace a single character with some other character, I can type R and then the character I want to replace it with. I um, don't remember those specific commands, we're going to talk more about those in a moment. But it's this underlying idea that the interface is like a programming language. There are these uh, 
keystrokes with mnemonic names, and the commands are composable. So you can learn different movement commands and different editing commands, and then kind of combine them in any way you want to make these compound commands. And that's what makes this tool so powerful. Um, so for example, there's a command to move forward by a word, if you just type the command by itself. But there's also a command to change something. So if you combine the command to like change something with the command to move forward by a word, then you can change the word, which means it'll replace the word that's currently highlighted, or where your cursor is, and then put you in insert mode where you can type in a new word. There's also a command to move to the end of a line. So that's a movement command. But if you combine the change command with the command to move to the end of the line, what'll happen is you'll delete everything from where your cursor is to the end of the line, and go into insert mode where you can change that content. Um, so this general idea is super powerful, and we'll go through the details of different movement commands and different manipulation commands and see how they can be put together uh, in a moment. Um, any questions about that general idea? This is probably really different from tools you've been using so far. Actually, quick survey, like what kinds of editors do people use? No opinions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you do use both. How many people use uh, graphical uh, editors? One, two, three. And uh, terminal based ones? Pretty no useful. Pad. No <laughs> pad. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so those are some of the kind of underlying ideas behind this tool. Um, some other things that are kind of uh, important ideas too. One is that we don't want to use the mouse for navigating a file, because it's like a kind of crappy input device that's not super precise and it's very slow. Um, instead, we want to use the keyboard. Like, we can use all 10 fingers, and once we know the commands and kind of have some muscle memory, you can move around a file and manipulate a file really fast using the keyboard. So when using this tool, uh, even though it does have mouse support, like here, select text and move my cursor around and stuff, uh, you really shouldn't be using the mouse. And really, the editor should work at the speed you think. Like, you should be able to think, like, I want my cursor to be over there. And then a moment later, your cursor should just be there. And using the mouse, I can't really do that. But maybe using the keyboard and knowing the proper way to talk to my editor, I can make that actually happen. My, my tool should just get out of my way and let me manipulate the file in the way I want, kind of at the speed I think. OK, so now we're going to get into some of the details. Um, any questions about philosophy or ideas so far? Cool, okay, um, feel free to follow along. Like, I'm sure you, just by default, have Vim installed on your computer. If you don't, if you're running Linux, like app get install Vim. If you're running Mac OS, brew install Vim, and you'll have the tool. Um, you can just open up a plain text file and play along um, if you want. Or just watch me type things into my terminal. Okay, so the first thing we need to know about Vim is the different modes. So remember I said Vim is a modal editor, it kind of behaves in a mode that's designed for inserting text versus a different mode that's designed for moving around the file or manipulating the text. Um, and so the way you know which mode you're in is that it's shown in the bottom left of your editor. Um, so see here, uh, it says insert. That means I'm in insert mode. Um, there are different modes. Here's visual line mode, visual block mode, um, just visual mode, replace mode. We'll talk about what the different modes are in a moment, but the way you tell which mode you're in is that it's just shown to you on the bottom left. And if it doesn't say anything, that means you're in normal mode. Now the way you switch between modes is if you're in normal mode, there's a key combination to take you into any of these modes. So if I'm in normal mode and I press lowercase i, it puts me into insert mode, after which I can type in text. Um, and then the different key combinations for what are called visual modes, which are for selecting blocks of text, are if I press V, then I go into visual mode where I can move the cursor around and select a block of text kind of linearly. There's also visual line mode. If I do capital V, I can select a block of text by lines. And there's visual block mode where if I do control V, I can select a block of text. And so selections are useful for different things which we'll talk about in a moment. So normal mode, press I, go to insert mode. Normal mode, press V, capital V, or control V, I can go into different types of selection modes. And the way I get back from one of these special modes back to normal mode is by pressing escape. Um, and so, small side note here, 
On your keyboard, the escape key is probably this tiny key in the top left, and it's kind of inconvenient to reach with your pinky. Um, the, the keyboard that the programmer of VI used uh, was designed such that the escape key was basically where the caps lock key is on your keyboard. So it was a much more accessible key that's easy to press. In Vim, you're always going to be switching back and forth between insert mode or visual mode and normal mode where you're spending most of your time. And so it's convenient to have an escape key that's not this like obnoxious thing in the corner. And so one thing you can do is you can remap your caps lock key to escape, because caps lock isn't really useful unless you want to shout at people through or something. Um, and so I think in a later lecture we'll talk about how you can do this on different systems, but as a quick thing to show you how easy this is on Mac OS, if I go into system preferences, keyboard, uh, modifier keys, here I can just remap caps lock to escape, kind of zero effort required, get rid of a useless key and have a very useful second escape key that's easy to press. Or to control, <laughs> better is control. <laughs> yeah, different people map their keys in different ways. <laughs> Um, so I think, for example, Emacs users are more likely to map their caps lock key to control or something else. Whereas for Vim, I think escape is a very popular way of mapping that otherwise useless key. Um, John has strong opinions about uh, mapping it to the control key, I guess, which you can talk about later. Or now, if you want. Uh, so the, uh, the reason I map it to control is because it's a key that's useful outside of Vim. And then I have control J in Vim set to escape. And control J is on your home row, so it's very quick to type. But then the control key is still useful in other places. The escape key, not so much. OK, so any question about modes or how to switch between them? Or kind of the general idea of what the modes are meant for? So you can see in normal mode, if I start typing text on my keyboard, it actually won't do the right thing because I'm giving commands to the editor. That's what normal mode is designed for. But if I press I to go into insert mode and then start typing text, it just goes into text file. Uh, I to go into insert mode, which is what we're going to be doing for the most part today, and then escape to go back to normal mode. Cool? Okay. So now we know what modes are. Well, let's talk about um, basic Vim commands next. I don't know if any of you have heard the joke of like, I've been using Vim for 10 years now, mainly because I don't know how to quit the thing. If you notice if you press control C, it doesn't quit. Um, the way you quit Vim and the way you do a lot of things is by issuing what are called X commands. Uh, X is a different editor, or like different component to the editor. Basically, if you're in normal mode and you press colon, you'll see that the cursor jumps down to the bottom left. And it's like colon and then I have my cursor. And then I can give, it, give the editor a command. And so there are lots of different X commands that do different useful things. Um, some basics are if I do colon Q, um, which is short for quit, and press enter, it'll quit the editor. So that's actually how you get out of the software. Um, other useful things, if I do colon W, which I think is short for uh, write, that, now see it says file written, that's how you save a file. Um, sometimes there are nice combinations of these things, so like there's a colon W Q. By the way, can everybody read that text or do I need to make it larger? I think make it larger for the video. Oh, I'm screen recording. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so there, for example, a combination W and Q, which saves and quits. Um, other useful things. If I do colon E, this is for edit. And this one is a command that takes an argument. So I can give it the name of a different file, for example, and go to edit that file. Vim can have multiple buffers open. So this is showing a different file open. If I do colon LS, um, it will show me a list of the different buffers that are open. Um, colon BN switches to the next buffer uh, in the list of buffers. You don't need to remember all these commands because uh, we'll give you resources to learn all these different things. But this is just to show you, like, if you think about using whatever editor you were using before, say Atom or uh, Visual Studio Code or whatever, these kinds of things like opening files or saving files, you probably did through the menus, right? Like you took the mouse, you know, moved the mouse to the top left and clicked through a bunch of menus to do things. Um, Instead so with this software, you issue commands as text. Um, once you memorize these commands, most of them just become muscle memory and it's super fast. Um, so another really useful uh, X command is the command called help. This editor actually has a ton of built-in documentation and the way you access it is through this help command. And so if you do colon help, you can give it the name of a topic. So I can do help write and it'll open up this thing telling me about the write command that I showed you a moment earlier.
So colon Q is actually not exactly quit, it's more like closed window, and so you'll notice if I didn't help write to look at this documentation, I did colon Q to go back from to looking at that documentation to editing the file I opened earlier. So these are some very basic X commands. This is basically telling you the equivalent of like what was in your uh, menu bar at the top of your editor you used previously. Also, beyond looking up uh, help for commands like this write command, you can look up commands for uh, the different keystrokes that are part of Vim's programming language that we'll look at in a moment. So like, how do you actually move the cursor around a file? You don't want to use the arrow keys, even though they do work. Um, there are better ways of navigating a file. Things like if I press the W key, my cursor moves forward by an entire word at a time. How do I know what the W key does? If I look at help W, see this documentation says, okay, this moves by word forward. So that's the help command, and that's a quick overview of some basic X commands to quit, to save a file, to colon Q, colon W, colon W, Q to save and quit, LS to look at a list of buffers, um, and help to learn more about the editor. And there are a ton of these commands, and they're useful for different things and we will give you resources to learn more about those. Any questions about X commands? Okay, so- I have a comment. Yeah. Uh, you can save yourself one character of typing by writing colon X instead of colon WQ. It saves you so much typing. Yeah, so <laughs> colon X is a shortcut for WQ. There, there are lots of things in Vim like this where, so Vim is kind of like a programming language, right? And so there'll be a combination of keys that can accomplish a certain thing. And then oftentimes there might be a shorter combination of keys that accomplishes the same thing. Well, I think we have some of those uh, oh, examples in here too. Probably. Um, like X versus CL, or uh, S versus CL, or things like that. Mm. Uh, CQ as well, it's handy. Mm. Um, okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is how do we actually move around this file? Um, well, there's insert mode where if I press I, I can actually type in text and it just goes into the file. But for the most part, when I'm programming, I'm like moving around the file and manipulating it. So how do I move? Well, one way I can do it is with the arrow keys, just like in Nano. And so I can like press and hold the down arrow key and scroll down in my file. But this is a really inefficient way to do things. There are much better movement commands. And so I actually recommend that you disable your arrow keys when you're learning Vim, just to avoid getting into these bad habits. Um, you can do that by um, putting a bunch of uh, commands into your vimrc file. So we can actually do that right now. Let's open up, uh, I'll just quit the editor, and do vim tilde slash dot vimrc. We'll talk more about what these uh, dot files are in the dot files lecture, which I think is next week. Um, but basically vim is configured through this plain text file called dot vimrc, where you write a sequence of vim script uh, commands. And these are the settings for your editor. And so this editor is super heavily customizable and you can remap keys and do all sorts of other fancy things. And so one thing you can do is you can even remap the arrow keys. So I can say, um, don't worry about what exactly this command, or what exactly this VimScript means. Uh, you can learn more about Vim, VimScript if, uh, if you care. Um, so this line of code says, when I press the, uh, I want to remap the left key to instead be the command this, like echo. So it'll just give me a message instead of actually doing whatever movement it was supposed to do. And so now, for example, if I close and open my editor again to go to reload this file, which it loads by default, now if I press the left key, uh, you'll see that it doesn't actually move left. I'm pressing left. It says instead use H at the bottom. Um, so Vim actually, instead of using the up, down, left, right arrow keys on your keyboard, um, for those motions, you use the H, J, K, L keys. And so H moves left, L moves right, and uh, J and K move up and down. And so like we could go and remap all our arrow keys so they don't actually do anything except complain at us and tell us to use the right motion key. So I'm gonna 
colon w to save this file, colon q to quit. Um, go back to my editors.md file. And now if I put my mouse somewhere um, and try using the up, down, left, right keys, it'll instead tell me, like, if I press up, it says, oh, use k instead, and so on. So, okay, so the most basic movement to them up, down, left, right is done with the hjkl keys, and there's some historical reason for that. But uh, today, like, this is useful because you don't need to move your fingers from the home row, you don't need to look anywhere, you can just move around without thinking too much. Um, but in general, you don't want to do these really inefficient motions. Like if you want to go down 100 lines, you don't want to like press and hold J and wait for half an hour while your editor scrolls down. Um, so there are a bunch of other movement commands in Vim that all work in this normal mode. Um, so we can move by words. So if I press W, it moves to the next word. See, it's skipping forward word by word. Um, if I press B, it goes backward by a word and goes to the start of the word. If I'm in the middle of a word, it goes to the beginning of the word. If I press E, that's another command. It goes to the end of the current word and jumps to the next word if it's already at the end of the word. So like if my cursor is here, if I want to go to the Y in productivity, I can press E to go to the end. If I'm here and I want to go all the way back to the beginning, to the P in productivity, I can press B. Um, if I want to go back by another word, I can press B again, and it'll go to the Y in your, and so on. So that's how you move forward and backward by words. Um, now, there are other useful commands to do kind of similar things in different scopes. So there are commands to move uh, to different parts of lines. Um, the zero key moves to the beginning of a line. Dollar sign moves to the end of the line. Uh, and then the caret key moves to the first uh, non-white space character in the line. So I, I indented this line a little bit just to demonstrate. If I'm here and I press zero, I go to the beginning of the line, dollar sign end of line, and caret this this symbol, um, shift six on your keyboard, um, moves to the first non-white space character. Um, any questions so far? Now don't be worried about memorizing these things. They'll become muscle memory soon enough and we'll give you tools to learn these things. There, there's a program called Vim Tutor that'll walk you through this kind of stuff. And there are also like interactive games and things that people put online that are actually kind of cool. Um, and now there are lots of other movement commands. Um, demonstration of some other ones. H goes to uh, the top of the screen. M, oh, sorry, capital H goes to the top of the screen. Capital M goes to the middle of the screen. Capital L goes to the bottom of the screen. Um, if I want to move by entire pages, control D goes down by a page. Control U goes up by a page. And so that's how you can scroll around in a file. Um, if you want to move by the entire file, if I do lowercase gg, that moves all the way to the beginning of the file. Capital G moves all the way to the end of the file. Um, I can go to specific line numbers in the file by typing colon, um, and then the line number, or I can type the line number, like one, two, three, capital G, and it goes to that specific line of the file. Um, I'm just like overwhelming you with movement commands, but we'll see kind of what these are useful for in a moment, just besides moving around a file and you can learn these over time. Some other kind of useful things, there's a command, uh, a movement command percent, which is move to the corresponding item. This is another kind of neat and useful thing. If my cursor is inside here, well, this is inside a parenthesized block, and so if I press percent, my cursor jumps to, uh, jumps to one of these parentheses and highlights the other, and if I press percent again, it jumps to the matching paren and then highlights the other matching thing. So if I'm inside here and I press percent, now my cursor is right here. And if I press percent again, now my cursor jumps to the closing parentheses on the right and highlights the one on the left. Um, other kind of useful things to navigate around lines, if I press lowercase f and then a particular character, that means find the first occurrence of that character on the current line. And so if I press f in single quote, for example, my cursor jumps to the first single quote here. If I press F and zero, my cursor jumps here. Um, there's also capital F, which is search backwards for the first occurrence of a thing. So if my cursor is here and I do capital F, single quote, my cursor jumps back here. Um, and there's another variation of F for find, which is T, which stands for two. So instead of finding a thing, you can jump to a thing, which is jumping right before the first occurrence of a thing. So if I press T zero, it jumps to the zero, but not on top of it. 
and capital T does the same thing but backwards. So like if I was here and it had a capital T single quote, I jump all the way back here right before the single quote. Um, okay, so that's some movement commands in Vim, and there are a ton more. They're all useful for different purposes, and you'll learn them over time. Um, now, one kind of interesting thing is that, right, I told you, Vim, uh, not just the underlying thing, but the, uh, the interface is really a programming language. And so if I want to say move down three times, I could press J, J, J to move down, down, down. But I can also do, I can press the number three, and then I can press J. And that means three times do whatever I do next. And so three J's move down three lines. If I'm, well, let's move, let me move somewhere else in my file. If I'm here and I want to move forward by five words, I can just press five W and it moves forward by five words. Three B backwards by three words and so on. And so this is the first exposure you're getting to seeing how these different commands can be composed together to kind of make more powerful editing motions. And then one more thing I'll show you right here before we move on to the next type of thing, which is which we'll uh, talk about, is searching. So um, if you're somewhere in a file and you want to move somewhere else, one really fast way of moving there is by searching for that text. And so the way you can do that is in normal mode, you press slash, forward slash, and your cursor will jump down to the bottom. And you can type in uh, regex that you want to search for. So remember, my cursor was up here. Um, say I want to jump down to this capital E editor. If I press slash and type in editor and press enter, my cursor just jumps down to the next occurrence of this. So it's a really fast way of moving around. Um, and once I'm in the search mode, if I press N, it'll jump to the next occurrence of whatever I just searched for. So here's the next occurrence of capital E editor, and then my cursor's down there. If I press N again, it jumps to the next occurrence. Um, if I press capital N, it moves backwards in this, uh, in this list. So N, N moves me down here, capital N, capital N moves me back here. Um, there I press escape GG to move all the way back to the top of the file. Okay, so that's some of the movement commands in Vim. These will eventually become muscle memory if you use this thing for a couple weeks. Um, so that's some of the stuff you can do in normal mode. Um, and another thing you can do is once you actually find where you want the cursor to be, say right here, I can press I to go into insert mode and start typing in text. Uh, say I want to like put an underscore there, and I want to put an underscore at the end of the line, I can press dollar sign, uh, a for a lowercase a for append, and like type in my underscore, press escape to go back to normal mode. Um, usually, all editing in Vim will be like you are in normal mode, you move your cursor somewhere, you go into some, uh, you go into insert mode, you make whatever change you want to make, and you go back into normal mode. That's what the regular editing workflow looks like. Now, there are modes besides just normal mode and insert mode. Remember, I talked about doing different kinds of selection. And so there's visual mode, if I press B, I can use HJKL or the arrow keys to move this cursor around and select a block of text. Um, I can also use all the regular movement commands from earlier. So again, you're seeing how these things compose. So if I'm in the selection mode and I press W, this jumps a word at a time. If I press 10J, it'll jump 10 lines down, uh, and so on. If I press escape, it cancels uh, and goes back to normal mode, get through my selection. So remember B for visual mode. If I do capital B, it selects by lines rather than selecting from one character to some other character. Um, again, I can use all the same motions I had learned earlier. So if it's 3J, it jumps down by three lines. 3K moves up by three lines, and so on. Um, and there's also something called visual block mode, which I enter by pressing Control B, and this selects a rectangular chunk of text. And we'll see what selections are useful for um, in a moment. Any questions so far? Or any comments from John or Jay? Yeah. Uh, are you covering marks later? Or uh, we are skipping marks. Okay. This is such a complicated tool, we're not even going to cover like 1% of its functionality today. But hopefully I will inspire you to learn more about it on your own. OK, so now we know how to move around a file somewhat comfortably. We know how to like open and close files and save files. How do we actually manipulate text? Well, uh, I think the way we should think about it is like this. Before, with your old editor, everything you were doing with the mouse, you're now doing with the keyboard. Like any kind of moving around, like selecting and dragging things around, 
you're doing with the mouse, uh, there are commands for doing that that are way more efficient. Um, so the most basic thing is you get your cursor somewhere, and you press I to enter insert mode, and you can start typing characters. Um, there's a different way to enter insert mode, which is pressing A, and that's like jump forward by character, and then enter insert mode, and I can type in characters, press escape to go back to normal mode. Um, but uh, just using Vim's motion commands and then using insert mode to edit my text is not going to be super efficient. Like, say I want to go and change the word productivity to the word high. Well, one way I could do that using the commands I've learned so far is like, okay, I press E to go to the end of the word, press A to move my cursor one to the right, and enter insert mode where I can actually edit the text, and then press backspace a bunch of times um, to delete this word. Um, and uh, that's not going to be super efficient. Um, in, instead, there are commands for doing different kinds of manipulations that you can kind of stack or like, combine with the different motion commands we learned. So, uh, let's see where I'm um, Before we talk about combining commands, one other kind of useful thing is if you're in normal mode, you press lowercase o, it inserts a line below and puts you in insert mode, so I can start typing text here. If I press capital O, it inserts a line above and lets me start inserting text there. Um, okay, so now for actual text manipulation commands. So the D command for delete um, is a command that takes a motion and then applies a deletion to that motion. So if I'm here and I press E, I go to the end of the word, right? If I'm here and I press D, E, it's delete to the end of the word. Um, if I'm here and I press D, does anybody remember the command for end of line? Yeah, dollar sign. So if I press D, dollar sign, it's delete to the end of the line. If I'm here and I press D, zero, it's delete to the start of the line. If I'm here and I press D, caret, it's delete until the first non-white space character of the line. If I'm here and I press D, three, J, it's delete three lines down. Right, so you can combine these in pretty sophisticated ways. There I like, combine the manipulation command with a number command for repetition and then the actual movement command, right? If I'm here and I want to delete these three words, I can do D3W to delete three words, right? The way you probably do this with your old text editor is you move your hands from the keyboard to the mouse and you go and you select the text that you want to delete and you press backspace. It's way slower than D3W, especially once it becomes muscle memory, which it will if you use this tool for any amount of time. Um, some of the kind of useful things that are variations of, say, the delete command. Here we deleted three words by doing D3W, and then we can press, say, I to go into insert mode and uh, type in whatever new text we want. Um, but instead of doing D and then the motion, if you press C and then do a motion, C is for change. So if I do change word, CW, it'll delete the word and then put me in insert mode so I can type in a new word as a replacement. So if I'm here and I do C3W, changes the next three words, delete the next three words, and put me in insert mode so I can type in something different. Um, and now here you're starting to see how there's some overlap between these commands, like D3W uh, followed by I to put me in insert mode where I can type in new text is the same as C3W, but you save a keystroke by, by doing the, the more specific command. Um, I'll tell you about a couple more manipulation commands that are kind of useful. There's another command called x, which is delete the character underneath the cursor. So if I want to go and like delete this period, I can go over it and press x in normal mode. And it just gets rid of that period. Um, now again, there's some overlap here. There's a motion to move right. Remember, hjkl is up, down, left, right? No, not in that order, though. Um, so l is the key that moves you to the right by one. If I'm here and I do dl, that actually ends up being the same thing as x. Like Delete one thing to the right is the same thing as delete thing underneath the cursor. Uh, but you save a character by pressing X, so the commands are kind of useful. Uh, there's a command S, which is substitute character. So S deletes the character <coughs> under the cursor, which puts you in insert mode so you can start typing in new things. So that's the same as D, L to delete a character, and then I to go into insert mode. Um, it's uh, similar to X followed by I to go into insert mode, but if I just press S, that's a single keystroke that does the same thing as those other things. Uh, so that's a couple uh, 
of these text manipulation commands. Um, you can also apply all these commands like change or delete to selections. So say, for example, I go into visual line mode, so I'm pressing Shift V and then JJ to go down by two lines to select this chunk of text. If I press C, it'll delete this chunk of text and put me in insert mode where I can type in something new. Or if I just select it, capital V for visual line, JJ to select two lines down, and press D, it'll delete that block of text that was selected and keep me in normal mode. So again, here you see how all these different things can be combined in whatever way you want. Like here we're combining, well, we're using visual mode, then we're using motion commands to select blocks of text, like we press 5J, it goes down by five lines. And then we're using a manipulation command to actually apply that operation to the block that was selected. Uh, another couple of keys that'll be kind of useful as we play around with this stuff. Um, if you make a change and you want to get rid of it, you can press U to undo. That's how I was undoing all these random deletions I was making. Um, and you can press Control R to redo a change. Um, that's another example of operations that were previously in the menus, or maybe had shortcuts from like Control Z and Control Y. Um, but now we have really efficient key combinations for doing all of these different things rather than like edit, redo, or something in the menus. Um, there are lots more exotic manipulation commands to learn, and actually they're kind of useful. Like, if you're using this tool for months, uh, you'll probably end up learning all these different combinations, and you will make use of them sometimes. Like, there's here's an example of one kind of exotic thing. If you press the tilde key, which is like the key to the left of your one key, you press shift and press that key, um, <coughs> it's marked like that on your keyboard, the squiggly line. Um, what that does is it flips the case of the character that's under the cursor. So like, if I want to remove the capitalization of this W, I can press tilde, and it uncapitalizes it. It's like a kind of exotic thing, you probably don't really need it, but if you know the command, it can uh, save you a couple keystrokes. Like, how would I do this otherwise? I might press uh, S to substitute, and then lowercase w, and then escape to go back to normal mode. That's a little bit more accurate than a single keystroke. Um, another related uh, command that's kind of useful is if you plus press lowercase r followed by a key, it's replace what's underneath the cursor by something else, like r, c, changes this to C, R, capital W, changes this to W, and keeps you in normal mode. So again, there are lots of these different manipulation commands that can be combined with selection and with movement commands and with uh, using numbers for repetition that kind of make up the programming language of the interface for this editor. Um, and so, how do you actually learn all these different things? Like, you're probably gonna forget whatever I showed you, right? There are like a bajillion commands. And they're maybe not so hard to remember because they're kind of mnemonic, like D is delete, C is change, and S is substitute, and so on. But uh, there are lots of nice resources out there for learning these commands. So one thing that's probably pre-installed on your computer already is something called VimTutor. Um, if you enter VimTutor, uh, ideally do this in an 80 by 24 terminal. Uh, let me do this in a hacky way. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, basically, VimTutor like opens up a special text file, which is a Vim tutorial. And it will walk you through like, basic movement commands all the way up to doing pretty advanced things. Like I think if you spend the time to go through this uh, tutorial that you do by using VimTutor, like, you will know the tool well enough that you can immediately start using it as a replacement for whatever you were using before without having too much of a hit in productivity. And then as you learn more things uh, that you can do with the tool, you'll end up getting even faster and faster than you were with your previous editor. Uh, there's another kind of cool thing, something called Vim Adventures. This is a uh, vim-adventures.com. If uh, the terminal-based Vim tutor is a little bit too dry for you and want something a little bit more entertaining, there's this online game that uh, teaches you how to use the movement commands and manipulation commands and so on. It's actually kind of fun to play through. Um, like if you try to use the arrow keys, I think it'll do something similar to what I recommended for you, which is like complain at you and tell you not to use the arrow keys. If I press the arrow keys, like, oh, don't use the arrow keys, use HJKL instead. And uh, whatever. It's a kind of neat thing to explore on your own time um, as an alternative or supplement to using something like VimTutor. Any questions so far? 
time flies. There's so much more we wanted to cover. Basically, I'm going to try to zip through this material to kind of show you some of the more advanced functionality of this tool, just kind of inspire you to uh, put the time into learning it. One thing that we touched on briefly earlier was that Vim is configured through this plain text configuration file that lives in your home folder in a file called .vimrc. And again, we'll talk more about doc files later. But uh, some useful things you can put in there. Um, uh, I got rid of my, like I have a pretty heavily customized vimrc and I got rid of it for showing you uh, vim basics in a vim setup that looks similar to how it'll look like uh, on your machine. But uh, you can get a lot of things. Uh, oops. Um, by putting a bunch of like basic settings in here, you can get a lot of nice things in your editor that are not there by default. So like for example, you can see here I have line numbers on the left. That's a couple of settings that give you line numbers. Um, you can get a setting that highlights text as you search for it um, by setting a couple settings. Um, you can have syntax highlighting by just turning it on. Um, setting the syntax on command. Uh, you can, uh, one thing you'll notice if you try playing around with the default Vim configuration, it actually doesn't let you backspace over certain kinds of text. Like if you're at the beginning of a line, for example, you go into insert mode and press backspace, nothing happens. Um, and so there's a, you can change that behavior as well. And so like this is another same thing that you might want in your editor's configuration. Uh, and so there are tons of different things you can customize. And there's no way, even if we wanted to like have a two hour long class and all the ways you could customize Vim, there's no way we could cover that all. And so some techniques you could use, people have these nice write-ups on the internet talking about like Vim configuration tips. And so you can look at those. And another really useful thing to look at is that people have their doc files on GitHub. We'll link to some of these in our doc files lecture. Um, and you can basically take a look at how other people configure their editor. Like for example, my configuration's all online. You can look at it if you want. And some people actually take the time to document their configuration. And so you can look at these, try out these settings yourself, and see if you find them helpful. Uh, and so it's definitely worth putting time into customizing your editor. Uh, do you mind if I cut into your time a little bit to show some fancy thing? No, 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 right. OK. We'll just be efficient. Yeah. <laughs> Minimize keystrokes. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, OK, so I think the last thing I want to do before John teaches you about version control is showing you some fancy functionality. Like everything we've talked about so far, you can already do using the tool you used before. But uh, I want to show you some kind of cool stuff. Um, so let's go back to editing this, uh, the lecture notes for this lecture. Now we have my configuration, so it looks slightly nicer than it did before. Um, one thing you can do, which you probably could do in your old editor, is search and replace. So the way you do that is go into X mode, percent %s is search and replace in whole file. And I can do something like, slash foo, slash bar, slash g. This looks very similar to the set uh, substitution uh, that John talked about during his data rendering lecture. This is basically regex search for this, replace with this globally in the file. Um, so if I apply this, replace foo with bar, now it replaced that text here, foo with bar. And so now this makes no sense anymore. Uh, you can even have it show the replacement live during a substitution. Yeah. So if I do that, I can do replace foo with bar, and I can see it as I type. And so this is more, this is really useful when doing fancier substitutions. Like say I want to take all these things which are like named markdown links, and I want to get rid of the named link and just keep the, the like actual URL instead. Well I can do that by say replacing, okay I want to like look for an open bracket followed by some text, followed by a closed bracket, followed by an open parentheses, followed by some text that I want to capture, um, and then replace that with the text I capture globally. And so here I can actually preview that change, and if I press enter, it'll take effect. And I've replaced all the named links in my Markdown document with just the raw URL. I press U to undo that change. So that's some fancy search and replace. Um, another kind of useful thing is split windows. So I think some editors let you open up multiple files, but does your editor let you have multiple views of the same file? Like what, what if I want to see the bottom 20 lines of text here and the top 20 lines of text here in the same file? Well, you can do that with this tool. So like right now, I've split uh, window into two, and I've loaded the same file in both splits. Um, so that's another kind of neat functionality. Um, 
Vip does have mouse support, which I recommend you don't use, but it's there if you want to go and enable it. And then one final thing to show you uh, what I think is a really cool piece of functionality in Vim. Let me open up a specific file that I prepared in advance. Okay, so say I have a task where I have this XML file, which has like a list of people, and each people, each thing in the people list is a person with a name and email address. Like say I have this piece of data, and I want to convert this to JSON, like a, a different data format. Um, well, one way I could do it is I could just go ahead and write like a Python program that loads the XML and parses it using whatever XML parsing library and then writes it out as JSON. But maybe for a one-off thing, or maybe if it wasn't exactly XML, but some custom format, like I don't want to write a parser and write like a full Python program or something to actually do that. Um, so what, what else could I do? Um, well, maybe one way I could do it is with these regex search and replaces. Like I could search and replace, say like I could search for like open, uh, like angle bracket name, close angle bracket stuff, followed by this and replace it with like that stuff surrounded by quotes and so on and like apply a bunch of these regex substitutions. But that can actually get really complicated and sometimes it's like hard to think about these really fancy regexes. So another cool piece of functionality in Vim is something called macros. You can tell Vim to record a sequence of commands and then you can have it replay that sequence of commands. And you can take a sequence of commands and store it in a register and then like record another sequence of commands and use a saved macro in a recording of another macro and so on. And so you can like, kind of interactively build these pieces of functionality, kind of like implement small functions that you just uh, implement by demoing it to Vim. And it's actually super powerful. And so here I'll show you an example of how I can convert this XML file into a JSON file um, just using Vim. So the, the key commands for doing macros are if you press Q and then a letter, it records a macro, you see in the bottom, recording at W. It records a macro in the register W, and then to replay that macro, I can do the at sign, followed by the name of the key. And so say I go here and I do Q W to record in uh, register W, press like J, 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 Q to end the recording. Now if I press at W, it replays J, J, J. Okay, so that's how macros work. Now how can I use that to convert this XML file into JSON? Well, let's work piece by piece. Um, First, let's just manually delete the first and last lines of this file. Um, so capital G goes to the end of the file, DD deletes the line, lowercase gg goes to the start of the file, DD deletes the line. Okay, now I have just this inner data. Um, let me first uh, write a macro to format like a single line, change this XML-ish looking thing into something that's more JSON looking. So let me do like QE for element, like I'm gonna record in the register E. Um, if I press the caret key, it goes to the first um, non white space element on the line. Now I can do R single quote to replace this with a quote. Um, F uh, close angle bracket to find the next close angle bracket. S to go into substitution mode. Quote, colon, space, quote. Escape to go back into normal mode. F open angle bracket to jump to this first uh, open angle bracket that's found. Um, capital C to delete from that point uh, to the end of the line and go into insert mode. And then quote. Um, escape, Q to stop recording. Now if I go to this line and do at E, it just applies all those changes to this line too. Okay, so now I have a macro that will nicely format a single line for me. Let me just go and undo those changes so I can work on a clean document again. Now let me implement a macro to format like one of these elements. So if I go onto the line that has person on it and do Q, say, P to format person, capital S to substitute that line, open, Brace because it's going to be a JSON object. Escape to go back into normal mode. J to go into the next line. At E to replay the macro I stored in E. Capital A to go to the end of the line and append, go into insert mode, comma, because I'm inserting a comma there. Escape to go back into normal mode. J to go to the next line. At E to replay that macro again. Um, J to go to the next line. Capital S to substitute. Close brace, comma, or characters I'm just typing in escape Q to stop recording the macro. Okay, so now I have a macro that should format an entire person for me and I can try that out by doing at P. Okay, so this formats a person. And now all I need to do is apply this to every person in here. And so I can record yet another macro. Let's say I'll uh, record this in the register Q. So I press QQ Q to register, uh, record a macro for the register Q, at P to apply the macro to format a person, 
J to go down by line, um, and then Q to stop recording. And now I can use, uh, I can just replay this macro again and again, at Q, at Q, at Q. And if I just do one, zero, zero, at Q, it's like apply this macro 100 times. Um, I need to apply it a bunch more times. Let's apply it another 100 times. I just type in 1,000 at Q, and it replays this macro until it fails. So like, when I got to the bottom of the file, when I tried to go down further, there's no more file left, and so the macro stops playing. And I'm basically done. Now I can just clean this up a little bit. I have this extra comma at the end. I can add the um, close square bracket to end the JSON array, and insert an open square bracket here and move this forward. And here we go, like this is a valid JSON file uh, that I converted from XML to JSON using BIM. And so this is just a, like, I didn't really expect you to follow all the details there, but this is to show you that this editor is capable of doing some pretty sophisticated and powerful things. Um, we have a little bit more in the lecture notes in terms of resources, like um, some cool things are that BIM has plugins and they do lots of really fancy things and you should look into those. Like here's an example of seeing the undo history visualizes a tree of changes. Um, you can navigate that super easily. There are tons of BIM plugins out there that do cool and useful things. Um, so you should look into those and those are all in the lecture notes. Um, so any questions about text editors? <coughs> Have I convinced you all to learn a text editor really well? <laughs> cool, okay, so let's take a 10 minute break and then we will resume with version control. Yeah.